Welcome to the X Podcast episode 21. So good to have you with us wherever you're watching or listening from, over the airwaves or on the YouTubes. We're thankful that you're here, <laughs> a part of our X fam. So I got my friends here, Russ, Tim. Nice to see you. You're smiling really big today. I just, it's the way you said episode 21, I just found it comical, that's all. Episode. Episode. I just thought it was. You know, I'm singing. Yeah. I'm singing. I'm singing. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Yeah, we've been in a really great conversation in our church, and we always discuss every week what we're going to bring to the podcast, and we thought, man, why don't we just expound upon the conversation that we've been doing on Sundays that you've been bringing to the X. I think it's been really helpful. We've been talking about emotional health. Yeah. Um, it, the, we're doing a series of conversations, the title being Soul Work, mm -hmm. and it really is just that. How can we take a deep dive, a look at the inside, especially in a time that seems to be so crucial for yeah. the formation of our lives, mm -hmm. not just as Christians, but as as people as members of society that are all going through this hardship and pandemic and isolation and businesses shutting down. And it's a global issue. And it's one that really crosses every sort of line. Um, it's really unique in that way. So I think it's great timing for it. Yeah. I and so let's expound upon it here. Mm -hmm. I'd love to just get more personal. I'd love to talk to you guys more directly about um, your personal journeys, how it's affected you, yeah. um, how we can take practical steps to really experience fullness in life and, and experience restoration in our soul, mm. uh, how that really works in a practical level. And yeah. I think it'll really help to hear you guys' story. So why don't you, Tim, go ahead and kick us off, talk through this series and where we're at in your heart behind starting it. Um. Sure. I think this past year, the pandemic, I think has uh, probably affected us collectively as humans, as Americans here. Um, I think it's probably impacted our soul more than any other part of who we are. And kind of just a real quick, what I view of the soul. More than our belly? Yeah. <laughs> more, more than, I don't know. The, cord, the COVID -19. quarantine 10. Quarantine the 10, no, COVID-19. It's the, close. Is it close? It's close. Um, but I think that, like, the way that we will feel the implications of these kind of things will be felt in our soul for a long time. And when I say soul, I would define your soul as kind of a combination of your mind, so your thoughts, your will, your desires, and um, of your emotions. And so if I think about any part of us that's been impacted significantly, yes, I think there's been spiritual impact. I think there's been physical impact. Um, but I think the emotional, the soul uh, impact is probably going to surpass those, mm -hmm. if you ask me. And I think it's a whole nother pandemic. Mm -hmm. And I think we've already, I think already, though, in our culture, that um, just the pace and everything about our American culture is impacting our soul more than we'd ever even imagine. And so I actually think that we have a soul crisis that's going on right now that um, and, and the whole point of why we're talking about it is because I really believe that one of the things that that following Jesus and one of the things he said was I came to give life and life to the fullest. And I just think that a lot of people are not they don't have real joy and they're, they're not satisfied in their soul. And I think we try to fill it with a lot of different things. But then like a pandemic will just kind of highlight how broken Oh, our yeah. soul is whether we see it in a mental anguish uh we see a, a, that's gone rampant in in the pandemic so we're seeing it in depression anxiety all of those things i just think too the lack of connection relationally impacts the soul um, i don't think it's a physical impact that's a that's an emotional impact and it affects us and i think there's sadness and i think there's uh grief and i because of loss all these things we've been talking about on this po podcast mm -hmm. grief the loss of 2020 and all those things we don't realize that at the heart of all of that is the human soul and the human soul is the i would say it's the real you it's you know not the physical part of what you see but it is your thoughts it's your life that's inside your head and your heart and you know when we say heart i believe we're talking about soul mm -hmm. And, and so I just feel like we're, we're just kind of as a church going, what does it look like for us to do soul work? And I think a big, a big concept that I'm trying to bring 
to this conversation, and I think this is where churches have missed the boat on this, mm -hmm. is that we often try to address emotional problems, problems of the soul with spiritual answers. Yeah. And so it's always like, well, pray more, read the Bible more, do these things. And I just don't know that that's the answer for deep soul wounds, mm -hmm. deep soul hurts, uh, uh, just, just all of the crisis that we're feeling in our soul. I think there needs to be work done on the soul before you're even going to see growth in those areas. I would argue growth physically yeah. and growth spiritually. Yeah, that haunted me when you said that. When you, the way you, you just phrased it, it's like, man— as the church and Christians in general over spiritualize our yeah. need mm -hmm. to uh, experience restoration of what's most intrinsic about us, what God puts inside of us, mm -hmm. our soul. Yeah. yeah. And you see, and people have, that is not a, uh, a, a, an effective solution on its own. I think that that can make a huge difference in your life and yeah. your outlook and, and lead you to different outcomes, but it's not a hundred percent the entire answer. Um, you said something else in prefacing one of your messages. You're talking about how much money, how much time, how much resource we put behind developing our physical bodies. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Gym memberships yep. that we never yep. use and pieces of workout equipment that are laying dormant in our basement that we swore to our spouses that we would use if we bought. Yeah. And, <laughs> yep. and how many of us are, are so focused on growing our physical body or, or working on our physical body or physical health and completely neglect what's inside in the soul. Yeah. And you see now with the pandemic, like what was what we were able to sweep under the figurative yeah. rug of our lives. It was, we could do that for a long time. And then when crisis came and when those feelings started to pop up of like loneliness, it was, just a lot more sudden and a lot more obvious than somebody who experiences that over the course of a lifetime. You, you yeah. don't just wake up, you know, after living a little bit of life when you're 55 and start a midlife crisis because you realize you're lonely. Yeah. It's like, no, I'm literally isolated. I can't go to work. I can't do anything I used to do. I'm literally lonely. And so you start to see now what the visual I get is people have been trying to sweep all these feelings under the rug. And it's kind of the habit that we all have is to sweep what maybe needs to be restored about our soul under that rug. And now everybody's just tripping all over their house <laughs> because they can't, yeah. we can't hide it anymore. Yeah. And you mentioned it, you see it with depression, anxiety, suicide. suicide even I was watching the Oprah interview with Megan and Harry. Not yeah. that I'm into that kind of thing. Yeah, you are. And not that I watched the entire <laughs> interview. Oprah's a really good interviewer. Yeah. That's why I watched because I was trying to learn how to interview for this podcast. podcast yeah, it's so, perfect. It's just professional development. But uh, it's just it, those things have skyrocketed to such an extent that there is a crisis. Mm -hmm. And we need real tools that are going to be effective in helping us um, achieve that restoration or getting to some place where we can live a more full, free life. Yeah. Where do I go from here? I mean, amen to all of it, I think. A lot of this we, we've hit before when it comes to pandemic, like what you said. It didn't, it expedited, but it mainly highlighted. Right. Mm -hmm. It highlighted, I love the analogy of the things in the house. You know, another uh, writer once says, kind of like fire, when you, when you bring fire to silver or gold, the impurities rise to the surface. Mm -hmm. So I think we've seen things rise to the mm -hmm. surface. But I do think it's fascinating to think about soul work and what he mentioned that you hit of all the things we work on in our lives that the reality is, I, I, you know, put different religions, philosophies aside. I think most people, if you were to press them would say, yeah, it's what's on the inside that counts. Mm -hmm. It's what's on the inside that matters. The truth is everything we experience in the outside world, life, joy, mm -hmm. pain, defeats, all of everything is connected to mm -hmm. the world within us. Um, but if you think about it, we spend a lot of time working on, uh, money, working on finance, working on career, working on everything. One of the last things we ever do mm -hmm. that we seem to avoid more than anything yeah. is soul work. Yeah. The number one thing that we would say is the most important. And I think too, where I like to bring in, and again, you might be watching this and maybe, um, maybe you're not someone who is a, you know, a, would say religious, or maybe you're not in the church setting. I, I think that, um, I think the church of all facets of culture have actually been more focused on dealing what's on the inside than maybe mm -hmm. other aspects of culture. Mm -hmm. I agree with you. I think yeah. we, we it, 
we are more obsessed in our current culture uh, with the physical and how we look, and that's why you see the beauty and the, the uh, all the surgeries and the Botox and everything that you can. There's so, that's such a huge business because we're always trying to hold on to our looks and our, you know, the physical appearance and working out and all the diets that are out there and everything you could do, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think that the church has been the one few, and I'm sure there's others in the culture for centuries that have said, we're going to focus on the inside. But I think where the shirt, where the church has fallen short is that we, 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 they kind of do, but then they, but they don't address it with emotional they don't address it always with emotional things. It's always been addressed with spiritual practices. Yeah. And I think that there's a combination. I think you need the spiritual practices. I think they can mm -hmm. help you, but I think a lot of times they expose things of the soul. And yeah. then there's work that you might have to do with a counselor. Mm -hmm. There's work that you might have to do in just, just going back and processing grief. Mm -hmm. right. There's a work that you're going to have to do that is not just going to be prayed away. Yeah. Does well, that make sense? Like you have to yeah. work. You have to dive like into that. You, you implied this in, in the opening, but one of the things that you really took time to define opening the series was that you believe, we believe as followers of Jesus, that we are made up of body, soul, and spirit. Mm -hmm. That those three things go together, they interconnect, but they're also different. Yeah. And I, I love that idea that, you know, I, I noticed this probably in my early 20s where I would meet people that would be really spiritual. And some of my greatest scars came from people that could pray for five hours a day, yeah. but didn't have an awareness of how rude they could be to other pe yes. people. Um, that pe people soul. that seem to have, uh, it, it's that idea that um, when your spiritual gifting exceeds your emotional maturity, mm -hmm. damage can happen to you and other people. Yes. Mm -hmm. That we believe that, I, I, that's why I think um, church is, is amazing because it deals with the spirit and a healthy church will help you deal with the spirit and the soul. Right. But if you only deal with the spirit and there's not a healthy language and there's not healthy tools to help you deal with the soul, then how deceptive can it be to let a religious smoke screen mm -hmm. cloud the deeper scars that you don't want to deal with and think that if you're spiritual enough yeah. to operate in a gift or to pray for five hours a day. Mm -hmm. I know for me, even looking into my own life, one of you know one of the things we've been going through as a staff, this this book series by Pete Scazzaro has changed my life over the last few years. And there's a phrase in the book that haunted me. He said it's easy for a Christian sometimes if they're not careful to use God to run from God. Mm -hmm. yeah. That idea that I could, I, I would rather at times dive deep into theology. It's like the woman at the well and, and talk about spiritual things, then peek under my own hood mm -hmm. and say, what's really going on and where are the leaks yeah. and where's the damage and where are the scars? Mm -hmm. And I think we do a lot of deception and damage when we elevate the spiritual, but we trivialize the emotion. I love that. So good. That thought, because how many times have you heard people inside of a church or even our church saying, oh, I just wish we went deeper. Oh, I just mm -hmm. wish we went deeper. When it oftentimes, if you want to talk about uh, Christian, it's very practical. It's very simple, mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's really difficult and quote unquote deep if you do it right. Right. And if you listen to what a preacher says about for, forgiveness, for example, that's mm -hmm. one of those simple topics that's really hard. It right. Has a lot to do with the soul, right? Yeah. Like yeah. Uh, yeah. harboring bitterness and how that can be affecting you, maybe in a way that's coming out just. Uh, passive aggressively in your life right and so those things are deep in mm -hmm. the whole idea of using god to run from god i i I've re i resonate with that mm -hmm. um and it's an interesting thought wow. just to see that play out in church settings too but well you can have I a high, i think you can have we've seen this in the church world you probably know people you got some people have a really high spiritual iq mm -hmm. but they can have a really low soul eq yeah so they don't manage their soul what do i mean by that they're not managing their emotions Mm -hmm. They're not managing, and they don't manage how they re, how they come off. They don't manage how they mm -hmm. relate with one another, and so yeah, I think you can have a really high IQ but a really low EQ. Mm -hmm. And I have said this, and I said it, I think week one. Mm -hmm. I think one of the, I think people don't realize that what is at the root of so many of their pains and their problems in life, in their mm -hmm. career, in their family, and all those things, is not a lack of IQ. It's a lack of EQ. Mm -hmm. And I think one, that's been something culturally, not just in the church, that's something culturally that has mm -hmm. been on the rise of the conversation of mm -hmm. our culture yeah. is the importance of EQ. 
Uh, that's yeah. and that basically just means managing mm -hmm. your soul, managing yeah. your emotions. How do you manage it? Well, a lot of leadership experts now will say that is a greater indicator of your success mm -hmm. yeah. in career and life yeah, than IQ. IQ or anything else. Yeah. I hate to bring up politics, but I, I was <laughs> I've been thinking a lot about Donald Trump's presidency. And I uh, it's just fascinating to me, just the whole, you know, whatever, however you feel about it. But I'm genuinely convinced that he thought that if you produced and were effective at getting things done in that position, that you wouldn't have to, uh, that you were above or could outrun a crisis. Mm -hmm. And I think fate would have it just hilarious not it's not it's not hilarious i take that back but it is ironic to the nth degree that there was this crisis that it doesn't matter how successful our country would be at these all-time high economic records and all sorts of things whether or not socially you agree with anything that happened but um at at the very top here comes this crisis from you know some pandemic it's this pan pandemic that gets into the country that the whole world um, can't seem to get a hang on. And the whole concept of how he handled the presidency, I think so many people try to handle it in their life, that I can out-success a mm -hmm. crisis. Yeah. But we realize now that your success in life and your fullness that you experience in life has a lot to do with how you handle yourself in the middle of a crisis. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? Are you following me? The mm -hmm. whole idea of you are going to experience the depths of the of the depths in life. That at some point you're probably going to go through some financial struggles. At some point there's going to be some sickness in your general uh, connection group. At some point there's going to be tragedy. At some point you're going to have to learn how to deal with loss. At some point you're going to uh, bite off more than you can chew, and you're going to have to experience some limits. At some point, you're going to have to extend grace. At some point, you're going to have someone's going to hurt you. You're going to have to extend mm -hmm. forgiveness. You're going to be in crisis, whatever that looks like for you. At some point, and it doesn't matter how much money you have. It doesn't matter um, how good you look. It doesn't matter how many abs are popping out of your belly. That you are going to have to find a way to lead yourself through crisis moments, mm -hmm. and. Um, it, it, and it's something that we can't avoid. So I think yeah. that's what this book is super interesting as far as the test that it gives you. Yeah. And it helps you identify when it comes to emotional uh, maturity, when it comes to emotional health, yeah. where do you rank on a lot of these different, yeah. uh, in a lot of these different categories that would help you practically uh, attack or work through in order to become more mature. Right. So how has that quiz helped you guys? Uh, what were some things that popped out to you? Maybe if you guys feel comfortable sharing your scores on how emotionally healthy are <laughs> you actually? Well, I don't know if I feel that comfortable because when I told you some of my scores, you <laughs> laughed really hard. <laughs> no, and no. I, I thought, why are it you was making comforting. fun of me? It was comforting okay. because we're all on a journey. Dad. <laughs> He's my emotional dad. He's uh, an emotional no. parent. He's further along than I am. I am for That's sure not. That was, part um, of, that was part of some of my wanting to do this series and going through it. It's just the, yeah. the journey of realizing, yeah. hey, there. I think I was the type um, that, you know, what has this, I think I've gone through some things over the last four years that uh, made me look inward. And I think m the rest of my life has been looking ahead. Mm-hmm. So I'm the type of person I'm wired to, to uh, accomplish. I'm wired to, to build towards something, to create vision, to lead to something, um, to eventually I'm going to reach this spot in career, that kind of thing. And so I'm just, I, I think I would just throw myself ahead and I never look within. Mm -hmm. It's not, a, you know, and when you look within, you got to look behind. You got to do all these other things when you go in. And so just some things in my life that, that really kind of led when me to a place of When you say you never do, like, I never look within, do you mean you never take the time to do it? Or you feel like it's hard for you? Or you feel like you don't know how to process what you find when you do? I mean, what does um, that mean? I think that, I think. Because one thing to ignore it. Yeah. It's another thing to be bad at no. it. No. Uh, my, I think my personality is of the type that I would just, 
run, it's, it's like that person, I think if you, if you were to say, hey, let's go run a race, and I'd say, okay, let's go, and we line up on the line, all right? And you didn't tell me how long of a race we were running. You just said, we're gonna go run this race. Mm -hmm. I'm like, all right, let's go. And so we line up on the line, and the gun goes off. And I'm gonna run as hard and fast as I can, as long as I'm ahead of you. I'm just gonna run, right? Mm -hmm. And you might come out, and you might be running a lot slower. And I'm thinking, what's wrong with this guy? I am so far ahead under that. The difference is, is that you knew it was a marathon. <laughs> and I didn't know that. Yeah. So I think I have lived my life to such a point where it is like run hard, push toward uh, what I feel like I'm supposed to be doing and creating with my life and where I'm supposed to be going. And I, I would never note the signs of, hey, this is, you're going to wear out and mm -hmm. you're going to, and so I, I kind of always just felt invincible mm -hmm. in that regard. And I, I also think there's some things in my personality that I, I'm becoming more aware of through things like Enneagram and other things that um, I, I would rather not. I, I don't, I guess I always felt fine. So here's, here's where it really started when I, and I, I told this to the church, when I took a break, a sabbatical, it's the first time I've taken like, I've, it, a forced slow you down since the church had been 14 years, I think in 14 years of ministry of doing that, of, of, you know, that was the first time that I, you, you separate, you disconnect from the normal rhythm and pace of life, which I'd gotten so used to. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until about four weeks in to that where you're not getting phone calls, you're not getting emails, you're not connected to the ministry, you're not, you're not going into the preaching office, preaching a sermon you're not every pre week, pre yeah. preaching at all. You're intentionally supposed to unplug from ministry. And it was about four weeks into that, I just was starting to get overwhelmed with really scary emotions. Mm. And so I'm calling a mentor of mine. I'm like, I don't know what's wrong with me. I've never felt this way. And it scared me mm -hmm. because I never felt that way about my profession, the ministry, where I was going. I'd never felt that way. And so I think what happened as I reflect back um, I think there was just a perfect storm of things. It was an I think there was, again, in the spiritual world, sometimes you feel like you're attacked. But I, I feel like that there was a lot that I, I had been running a marathon for so long. Mm. Might have been a, triathlete, a triathlon. I don't know. <laughs> like, I've been going for so long that it became normal. Mm -hmm. And then the moment I slowed down, everything caught up. Mm. So it's like my soul finally, like, you can be, I think, I think you can, in life, be 20 steps ahead of your soul the whole time, and you'll never really know what's in there. Mm. And so for me, I think that, that brought to the surface some things that I just did not know, and I had to kind of address them. Mm -hmm. So I began to talk to a counselor, and then I was just dealing with a lot of other things. And it was in that process, and when you got people who are asking you questions, you know, you got someone who's asking you questions about your family, and they're asking you questions about what was it like for you growing up. And, you, you know, it's like, my childhood was fine. Why are you asking me these things? But what it did was, with a counselor, was help me learn to process. I had not been processing. I didn't process pain. I didn't process grief. I didn't process loss. I just cut it away, write it out of the story, keep going because I've got something I've got to do. Mm. I'm called to do something. And I think you can do that for so long, and, but I think eventually it'll catch up to you. Mm. And so I don't even know what you asked. No, but, you can't outrun it. But, but I, I just, good... but, I, but I think that's kind of like where, for me, it started probably four-ish years ago becoming a real journey that I had to look within. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I, I mean, I had, I, had a, I had one moment that um, it wasn't just that break. I had another moment. Um, I won't get into the details of it now, but it's just like where I thought I was having like an emotional breakdown. Mm hmm like I just had another moment where I was shaking on the inside where I'm dealing with just some weird emotions and thoughts. And so I would say probably my lack of addressing my break. soul. No, that was no, that was months after. No. No, this was months after. Mm -hmm. This was this was uh, uh almost two thirds of a year later. Mm. Uh just going through a variety of other things. A massive amount of pressure, I think, just caused it to come to the surface. To where uh, I think I think it was the culmination of all those things, and so I think you can run and, like you said, I think we can try to out outmaneuver, outpace, you know, the hurts, and maybe there's some things you know that in your life that you never process, mm -hmm. but eventually, 
things will happen like a pandemic. Mm -hmm. Things will happen like you're going to go through some kind of crisis mm -hmm. in your family. And what you're going to end up dealing with is not just going to be that crisis, mm -hmm. but it's going to be the mounting things from the previous 30 mm -hmm. years or 40 years of your life that you never really thought through, addressed, realized how much they part of your makeup and how you you know, push these things aside and how you don't really talk about your feelings and how you don't connect well with your kids in this way or how you don't, you know what I mean? Like oh, it yeah. just, it just all, I think, I, I think what it took was traumatic experiences on the external that forced my soul and me into this collision yeah. course. And, and then so through that journey out with a counselor and getting to a place of being healthy and reading books like his book where it began to kind of like piece together like a puzzle for me and go, wow, this is important. I think a lot of people will resonate with the whole idea of like, I just don't know if it's worth it to revisit things that have hurt me that I've mm -hmm. kind of learned how to write out of my life and write out of my story. And that's something I've wrestled with. It's like I'm in a season where I've, I've tried to get – right down into all of the all of the things that are screwed up about my soul and just all all the grief and all the relationship <laughs> drama you got to yeah. work through and all the bitterness you have hidden and all the unforgiveness you have I mean it is and all the uh, the fear of things like never being enough and yeah. never making enough and never uh, living a life that is significant enough I mean all of those things um being too short. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but all of those things, and, and I oftentimes go, why, do I, why am I doing it? Like, what's the point? What is the point? Because it's hard work. Yeah. And I think that what I've come to is that uh, it's really hard work that if I don't address now, and if you don't decide to address now, going back to last, last week's podcast of these men who, who mm -hmm. got caught up in these um, really unfortunate situations, some worse than others. That it that spill what's unaddressed into, in your soul yeah. is a cancer yep. that will metastasize in every part of your life yep. if you don't get to the root of it and if you don't address where it's starting, how it's growing, how you're feeding it, mm -hmm. and um, yeah. and so if it's hard and if you're a little bit scared, I'd say yeah, it, it's probably appropriate yeah. to feel that way, yeah. but it's worth it. Yeah. Yeah. Whether it's other people or your own soul, what you don't confront, you condone. Mm -hmm. And so if you don't, and I love what you said as far as this when you, because our stories are similar in a way. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, well, we're both Moors. <laughs> we're both Moors. We're both threes. I feel like the only, <laughs> we're not related. We're both, FYI. we're both preachers. <laughs> we're not, we're not related, but anyways, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, but you're way more emotional than him. I am. You are. Yeah, so, like, I've always been introspective. Like, yeah. my whole life, I yeah. felt introspective. Mm -hmm. So that's a little bit of the difference. Yeah. But, you know, it, I, I guess it's not until you mature, and it's not until you get older, and until you really... I mean, you know, one of the things I think is probably a great way to put it is that what is in you doesn't come out until you slow down, until you either choose to slow down, or until life forces so you to slow correct. down. I mean... Part of what this book eventually goes into is how do you, on your own, instead of waiting to hit a wall, mm -hmm. how do you actually intentionally cultivate practices in a way of life yeah. where you have silence mm -hmm. and you yep. have a slowing of down? It's, you talked about the pace of your soul. Is that, there's that interesting story in, in John Mark Homer's uh, book, Ruthless Elimination in a Hurry, about the, that tribe that, that didn't own watches or clocks and, yeah. and there was some rescue mission. I don't remember all the details, <laughs> but anyways, they were, they were walking from place to place to place. And the, uh, these uh, Western, you know, hurried Americans were with them. And at one point, the villagers decided, no, we're not moving anywhere today. And they asked them why. And they said, because we're waiting for our soul to catch up with us. Yeah, I remember that. <laughs> and the idea in Western society <laughs> so of, smart, of, of being, a, of having any awareness of yeah. where your soul's at, yeah. it, just, it, it almost just doesn't exist. Yeah. And I so agree. there's either you choose to slow down and it comes up, or <laughs> something, sl it's like, like we use the analogy of uh, a peek under the hood. <laughs> but let's be honest. You're not going to take the time to peek under the hood until you really feel like you need to. Mm -hmm. Until uh, there's smoke coming out it was like, or there's a knocking. <laughs> I think eight years ago, I saw this message by T.D. Jakes where you talk about potholes. Yeah. And, you know, you, you hit a bump in the road. You're like, oh, that, that was, okay, I hope that wasn't anything, you know, hope that wasn't anything crazy. Um, then you hit another, but he talked about that sometimes 
you're driving down the road, you had a pothole oh. so big jarring. and jarring that you have to pull over to the side of the road. Mm -hmm. And you can't just keep going like you've always gone, but you have to assess the damage. And I think part of where I resonate with you is, yeah. you know, even though I was introspective my whole life and I, I always was looking in, maybe part of it's what I didn't have the tools for it. Maybe part of it's I didn't have the language for it. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it was about five or six years ago where I hit a wall. And when I hit a wall, um, I was forced to, to look under the hood. And part of the work was, you know, I had people in my life that uh, had books that were tools. And uh, Enneagram was a huge mm -hmm. tool to help me understand my own soul. Yeah. And, and that work, uh, I mean, was just life-changing. I'm still in that work. I think until the day I die, sometimes I'm like, man, I have learned so much about myself. When you say hit a wall, can you dive in a little bit more? So... 2016, uh, that year before the, um, I don't have time to go into all the detail, but the year before, uh, the, the place I'd moved to, uh, to do ministry in Atlanta, um, the pastor that had hired me left and it was the second time that I'd moved to plant my life somewhere and the leader ended up moving out of state. Mm -hmm. And then all of my friends that were around the table moved out of state. And then I meant to tell you that we're moving to Florida. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm coming with you. Yeah, and so it's joking, everybody. Yes. I, joking. I, I think in that season, a, a perfect storm happened. One, um, I had ignored the fact that on my dad's side of the family, depression ran in that side. Mm -hmm. So my dad, a few years before, had had started had went through about a year of depression. Mm. I, I felt that creeping up. I felt some um, some areas in my life uh, that probably I excuse if that's not that big of a deal. Um, I felt creeping up. Mm -hmm. Then my pastor leaves, the church changes, all my friends leave. Mm -hmm. And then I go through some relational heartbreak. Mm -hmm. And then all of these things that I had always suppressed, even, even things like, what's that phrase? Is it Orberg that uses it? The, a cancerous restlessness. Mm -hmm. I'd always had this cancerous, like, I'd always been this extremely ridiculously joyful person, but always a restlessness. Mm -hmm. um, for not to get, oh, super Enneagram again, but... Um, Three wing four, Ian Cron says, is one of the hardest emotional like mm -hmm. numbers. Yep. So all of these things I'd never known how to name, just all in one season. And then there are some ways in that season I handled it well, and then some ways in that season I didn't handle it well mm -hmm. that just expedited into I ended up taking a month mm -hmm. sabbatical. Yeah. And um, I traveled a little bit. Uh, it was in that season that I thought, I thought I knew some of the things that I felt like God wanted to talk to me about, some of the things I thought were wrong with my soul. And then all these people that, people that knew me and didn't know me said, no, there's something in you that I believe God wants to talk to you about. This may sound like really spiritual language if you're not familiar with church, but that is absolutely completely different than everything that you think the season's about. Mm -hmm. And all of it had to do for me with pace. Yeah. And all of it had to do with the pace of my soul and things that God wanted to show me under the hood mm -hmm. once I hit that wall. Mm -hmm. And for me, some of it, uh, to be vulnerable, had to do with uh, um, insecurity, roots of rejection that I didn't mm -hmm. think I had, um, uh, and this cancerous restlessness. And I'm like, where did that come from? Yeah. And so for me, I know we've talked about some in past podcasts, but Sabbath and slowing down yeah. and resting. And a lot of books, like, um, the only reason I throw out some of these books is, uh, was it... Um, Cassandra Cassie McDonald. Some some yeah. some people told, told me lately. Every time you guys say a book, we buy him. Uh, <laughs> so like Henry Newman's Prodigal Son was huge for me. Mm -hmm. Everything Enneagram work of Ian Cron, um, uh, David Brenner, Falling Upward, The Gift of Being Yourself, um, Emotional Healthy Spirituality, anything yeah. by Comer, or Willard, or yep. Ortberg. All those guys like those books became an emotional awareness mirror for me. And I was yeah. fortunate to have community around me too that was doing soul work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I don't even know if I answered the question, but, but well, yeah. you asked about assessments too. Yeah. So assessments, um, well, let me, let me just, we'll get there in a second. I, I just want it. There's one thing that me and Andrew were talking about it the other day that how many people just to speak to this sentiment that this work is just completely necessary. And even now more than ever in our culture, we were talking about how many people we know who, like dozens and dozens, like 
a lot of people that we know that are now taking medication for depression or anxiety, mm -hmm. her and I <laughs> included. Okay. And how happy we are that people are seeking help. Right. And how sad we are that, that so mm -hmm. many people that we love and know need um, to go on that journey. And the only thing that it highlights for me is that the way that we have been trying to live life as Americans, mm -hmm. it's broken. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It is fundamental. There is something about what we idolized life to yeah. be and the pace. And who knows? Is it, the, is it the introduction of a smartphone mm -hmm. and the, what, uh, the introduction of a s social media culture where not that comparison wasn't a problem before, it's just it's a million times more present in your life. How often the dopamine hits that you're getting every time a notification mm -hmm. goes off on your phone, the emails popping up, the, I mean, little things that get me excited throughout the day. Like, uh, my Zillow app says that there's a house for sale. Even though I just moved <laughs> three months ago, but I don't Are know why I just love looking at, at house prices. I oh just think gosh. it's fun. But these, these, all of these things that have changed. And when you talk about the, the Western, Indians or whatever you were talking about, what, what about just... moving and their soul catching up. What would oh. you say again? <laughs> oh, that, that was so, I, slightly accurate. I read yeah, that. Yeah, but, but, but the whole idea of, accurate. man, like, I don't know if our souls have caught up to the technology. No. The weapons that we have now in the world to do good and to do evil, yeah. I don't think our souls have caught up to. No. no. The, the, the pace that society goes out now is oh. unprecedented in human history. Mm -hmm. It is unprecedented. And... There is no way that they talks about who is it that says hurry does violence to the human soul. Mm -hmm. Like know. when you think about if, if everything that is in the soul that is in the world inside you determines everything about the way you experience the world outside of you. If it, what does Jesus say? What is it? What is it? Profit a man to gain the world but lose his soul. Mm -hmm. yeah. But if you don't, if you carve, if we carve out. However many waking hours we have a day to work, to money, to our physical fitness, yeah. but don't have space to actually slow down to hear what's in the soul. Oh, yeah. Like the noise is the enemy of the voice of God. Yeah. And I, I'm, let me speak from a, a follower of Jesus perspective for a moment. For me to know what's in my soul, I need the one that made my soul mm -hmm. to speak to me about what's going on in my soul. Mm -hmm. I need to slow down long enough for the crap to come up and for me to reset and mm -hmm. for me to actually be able to, to erase enough noise yeah. to hear the voice of my maker say, here's what's going on. Here's what we need to talk about. Here's what I want to heal. Mm -hmm. here's, what, here, here's what I'm dreaming of for the future. And it is, um, it is a terrifying, for me, even on Saturdays, even though I, I, have, I am nowhere near where I need to be, I'm going to be on this journey until the day I die. Mm -hmm. But even on Saturdays when I do take a Sabbath and my soul does begin to catch up with mm -hmm. me, and I reflect back, even not just on the last three, five, seven years, even when I reflect back on that week mm -hmm. when I got too busy and I got too hurried and I got too frenzied mm -hmm. and, and, I, and I wasn't walking and abiding in Jesus, I will look back on regret and with cringing, even from conversations of that week. Mm -hmm. And I think to myself, man, for 10 years, like, I was that kid that could never ride down the road without music going on. Mm -hmm. yeah. I felt like I tried to cover what was going on in my soul with pace and noise. Mm -hmm. And then the thought of how many people and how many generations live their entire lives and never pull over to the side of the road mm -hmm. to slow down for their even soul. Even the patterns you see all around you, like, you don't, you don't, build a building without a strong foundation yeah the first thing you look at when you purchase yeah. a home is what do you do you go to the basement you look at the foundation yeah you don't build it if you build a skyscraper without something substantial underneath architecturally then the damage you could do it's mm -hmm. indescribable it's unfathomable and we we see that pattern in every part of life but mm -hmm. in our own hearts in our own mm -hmm. souls and so i think the question is what are your foundations yeah. what are your footers you've preached message on god footers mm -hmm. before like how do you mm -hmm. build a foundation that matters and that can sustain you mm -hmm. through every season and i don't and we're not saying that success is bad 
We're not saying social media is always bad. We're not saying that the Internet's bad. We're not saying America's bad. We're not saying we're really not speaking to uh, the the, you know, moral implications of any of those things. Really, I think the question is, are you doing the soul work that you need to be doing in order to gain the emotional emotional maturity that you can experience a full life. I mean, that's yeah. the yeah. that's the baseline of what we're saying. No, and yeah. so I I think that's I think, a, I think you can go look just to add to that. Yeah, um, is there's nothing wrong with building, creating, uh, accomplishing. I think some people are more wired, maybe even than others, to to uh, conquer, to mm-hmm. create. I, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I mean, you can look in the Genesis one, and it was like God created everything that we see. If you know, if you're of a faith background, you might go, "Okay, I buy that." Well, even He took a day. It says, and the word that you use there is a word that means to refresh your soul. Mm-hmm. And so here's here's God setting. It. I think you can run hard as long as you also have enough pace mm-hmm. at times to go I'm running hard I got to slow down. Yeah. I got to stop and I got to like those like the Indians that culture said or what if it was Indians but <laughs> they, they said I've got to wait and let my soul catch up. Well Jesus and his disciples modeled hustle and health. Yeah. There's a place to hustle and health. There's a place part of a, a productive inspiring life is that you are chasing after something yeah. great. Yeah. The problem becomes in any season where I become more infatuated with what I'm doing than who I'm becoming. And Mm -hmm. everything in my life and the Mm -hmm. quality of what I produce and the motives of why I produce it and the way it affects other human beings and who I become and who everybody attached to me will become will ultimately come out of who I'm becoming in the center Mm -hmm. of what my soul is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. And I think uh, that there's a difference between emotional health and emotional maturity. And one of the things that we, I threw out was, you know, that I thought was kind of funny. I don't know. It's maybe not that funny for some people uh, to hear that. But was, you know, taking this assessment that he has in there about emotional maturity, mm-hmm. uh, just highlighted areas. Here's what I think it does. It highlights areas where you may not be healthy. Mm-hmm. And it helps you see other areas where maybe you are healthier. But I do believe that as, as we hear a lot being said about emotional health today, I would argue and say emotional health is not the same as emotional maturity. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, there, I think you have to get to a place of being emotionally healthy before you're going to start maturing. Yeah. But I think we do not want to stop short. That's what my hope is for our church, our community, for myself. I... I could not even think about emotionally maturing when I was dealing with a lot of things in my soul. I had to get to a place of being emotionally healthy. Mm-hmm. It took time. I'm dealing with traumatic situations in the ministry. Uh, I'm dealing with traumatic things that, and how it affected my soul. And so for me, like, I had to go through that process of a lot of processing, a lot of praying, a lot of talking with a counselor, a lot of journaling, mm-hmm. a lot of ups and a lot of downs mm-hmm. to, to finally, I just, I don't remember exactly when it was, but I just remember it was about a year and a half after having those starting to talk and meet and going to that, that I started to feel like on the inside, like I feel, I feel like I've recovered. Mm-hmm. So I don't know what it was I went through, but it felt like I got to a place where I recovered. And I think once you get to a place where you're emotionally healthy, how do you do that? You're going to have to address things like we, you know, doing a genogram where you're going back to your family history and talking about past things in the family and how that could affect maybe the way you're seeing things, the way you're treating people, the mm-hmm. way you're, you're receiving what's going on. So, you know, I think you have to kind of do some work in areas of pain and then you get to a place of health. But then I think that's where it's important to go. I think what some people do is they get to a place where they feel healthy. Mm-hmm. And, and here's what they do. I'm on medication now. I... I'm removed from that situation. I, you know, time has gone by and, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm good again. Okay, well, through all of those things, you might have gotten emotional health. Mm-hmm. Those things are not going to help you grow. Mm-hmm. They're not going to help you mature in those areas. Mm-hmm. So I like how there's an assessment so it can point things out to me. And what I'm hopefully doing now, my journey, is I'm trying to mature mm in my emotional awareness and my, who I am as a person. So those are, to me, I just think it's important for us to understand the, the difference between get healthy, but also get maturity, right. grow in those areas. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
So why don't you guys run through, and I'll share mine too, um, areas through that assessment that popped up as potentially weak. It's funny how it kind of classifies the, <laughs> the different results. As it, it classifies, what is it, eight different areas on whether or not you're uh, an emotional adult, <laughs> an emotional adolescent, child, or, or an infant. infant. We could just go through it real fast and say, which one were you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which one were you? So general formation and discipleship, which is kind of a separate one, which I think dealt with just kind of basic spiritual, because mm-hmm. this, was, this was built around discipleship. Mm-hmm. So how did you rate on that one? Part A, emotional uh, discipleship. I only have my highest and my lowest, because I think I threw it. <laughs> yes. Oh, you don't have it. <laughs> no. How did you do on that Which one? I told you before this podcast. I, I, I still I was, that. that was my highest one <laughs> and an emotional adult. Uh, it was, it, this is, the score is 28. Yeah, out yeah, of 28. Yeah, I got 28. Stop. Uh, what did you get? I actually got a 25 on that one. Yeah, I got 21. Did you? Okay. Yeah. Was that, you that were judging me about that I earlier. was not judging. So what well, is that, though? Actually, that's what so you what, do for a living. That? that doesn't make any sense. That's what you do for a living. Are you an emotional adult? Are you an emotional adolescent, infant, or a child? It looks like you're, that means... You're, I think, an adolescent. Just a high adolescent. You're about an, you're about an eight, 17-year-old. <laughs> Am I? Um, the, some of the questions like feel uh, are very spiritual based. I spend I spend regular quality time in the Bible and prayer. I love to worship God by Why myself. Why do I score others. so is, low? Uh, That's what I ask since you're a pastor. <laughs> uh, I consistently integrate my faith in the marketplace and in the world. Those are some of the questions on that basic one. So I don't really know why you scored that low. We'll have conversations <laughs> later about that. I'm just, no, just kidding. I'm really hard on myself. Uh, um, that's fine. That's fine. Look at, let's go to part B. Okay. Part B is where it gets another one. Yeah. Look beneath the surface. It was questions one to six. 24 out of 24, mm-hmm. I scored a 15. Look beneath the surface. A 15 so, puts me square as a probably, I'm going to say, a, a 13-year-old adolescent. Okay. Yeah, I'm going so, by age. Adolescent. I was emotional so I, adolescent. I actually got 21 in that, which, well, according to this, I was barely an adult. But you even said you're more introspective. Yeah, so I be, don't. I think it. this is where I'm going. Oh, mm-hmm. I'm not good at looking at my soul. Mm-hmm. Look beneath the surface was that category. Mm-hmm. I think I'd rather know what you guys scored your most mature in and what you scored your least mature in. I'll go first because uh, that's the only <laughs> thing you know. Yeah. So, but I think that that's helpful. I'm getting lost even listening to you guys. Okay. I but I love you both. I think that. The most mature that I was was dealing with grief. Uh, the category there, I was an adult there. But I was a child when it came to, uh, uh, what is it? Re- limits? Receiving Receive the, the gift, gift of, of limits. limits. Yeah, I was, I was the lowest there. What was the, it? the whole idea of um, understanding boundaries and understanding your limits as a person and your, your limits in life. You, you're the person that tried to do it all. Yeah, bite off more than I Bite off more than you should. Yeah. Which I never understood as emotional health, for one. So that was super helpful. Well, I think, well, I think the thing that was interesting about this test that actually revealed a lot, I, even in some of the circles when we were taking this, it, that's helpful is this gives handles for how to even measure. So, like, yeah. certain people were like, wait, processing grief has anything to do with my emotional health mm-hmm. maturity? Yeah. It's like, mm-hmm. oh, it does. Mm-hmm. Some people, I remember even at the table, were like, oh, I didn't know that mm-hmm. actually made sense that that was a yeah. good thing. Mm-hmm. Um in Sabbath and rest. Uh, so my highest was on um, living in brokenness and vulnerability. And my lowest was in make incarnation your model for loving well. What does that mean? I, I don't, don't even know. get that. I don't know. Uh, I don't believe in that reincarnation That was one of my either. lowest ones. It, it is, um, it's all about like seeing other people and how you, you know, mm-hmm. it's almost like I can feel what you are going through. Like I can, empathy. Like, it's, it, yeah, but it, on a deep, deep level. I think my highest was the general formation of discipleship. But if you kind of take that out, my next highest was living, living brokenness and vulnerability, uh, which is kind of more, really, yeah, which is m- more about understanding and awareness mm-hmm. of yourself was that mm-hmm. one. Uh, my lowest was what your highest was, mm-hmm. embracing grieving and loss. Oh. I got I got an eight out of twenty, so that put me that put me as an emotional child mm. in that category. That and make incarnation your model for loving well, which again these categories mean nothing. But you know if you look at the questions, then you know um, that's what kind of will help you understand those. 
it's like like the first question on making incarnation your model for loving well again there is like i'm regularly able to enter into other people's worlds and feelings connecting mm-hmm. deep with them deeply with them and taking time to imagine what it feels like to live in their shoes mm-hmm. yeah it's uh, i scored myself a two out of four on that this book i think is something that <laughs> if it, i would assume that most of the people listening to this podcast are um, are very interested in and that's why you're listening is because you want just a word or a phrase or a conversation mm-hmm. that could help you build a life that's worth something and that is mm-hmm. full and so where you can live a life that's different than those who just care about uh, you know the things of the world or um, you know material things but you care about growing as a human you care about growing in your self-awareness you want to be someone who makes other people's lives better and yeah. you add to their lives and you have a story to share and you want to encourage them with the hope in jesus and you want to do those things yeah. that's why we hope you listen um but it's hard to do that work without first identifying where you are lacking mm-hmm. yeah or if you don't believe that you are lacking anywhere we all know people like that and have probably been those uh <laughs> Why did you look at him? I just I don't know. He's, Thank you he for scores himself at really high on But a lot of the whole idea of you can't He's just you can't identify you can't way. fix things that are broken if you haven't identified what's not well, working. Do you know what this helped me do when I saw that my lowest this is how I used it. I said this one is my lowest. It made me question why. Mm. Cuz I feel like as I was taking this my life I was like I don't feel like I'm I don't feel like I'm dealing with loss. Mm-hmm. I don't feel like I'm struggling to grieve. Mm-hmm. What do you mean this is how I scored the lowest? And that's what's good about sometimes having somebody building an assessment where they're asking you questions that are kind of innocent, you know, how do you rate yourself on this? Then you get to the end and go, "Oh, that's that that category." And so I think the way I've used it to my benefit is in conversations that we've had mm-hmm. and other things where mm-hmm. we talk about people that have left you mm-hmm. and people that have walked out in the, our circle context of ministry. People have said things. People have done things. Uh, to, to me, for us to be on conversation to say, well, this is what I do. Mm-hmm. Here's how I cope. Mm-hmm. And then to mm-hmm. kind of have to unpack that and go, yeah, but do you think that's healthy? Mm-hmm. And you're great at being annoying when it comes to... <laughs> I always say that Sorry. Kevin's kind of like my... Sorry. My, my uh, friendly on staff counselor because anything you ask he'd be like yeah but no really mm-hmm. no i mean like but is that really how you feel and for that's 400 an hour i'll be your counselor uh, i too. know he will <laughs> so um it's it's so it's um it's helped me kind of go i it's it's helped me look look under the hood yeah in an area that i just didn't think I, i'm fine mm-hmm. i would just have to, i'm fine i don't have any bitterness or anything i'm fine i don't have any issues mm-hmm. and then but i and that's why i think that sometimes this is great. These kind of things are great to help you maybe be aware of something, but you need to know how to do what to do with it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I do think that taking these kind of things and speaking to a counselor or speaking to somebody to say to so that they can have the handles to say, okay, hold on, let's dive in here. Mm-hmm. Why? Mm-hmm. What? Where have you lost? What is it? What? Okay, what did you feel when that happened? That's a, all the stuff that a counselor said. Mm-hmm. Okay, what were you feeling when that happened? I don't know. I was, you know, I guess I was feeling this and that. Like, what, what were you thinking about? You know what I mean? Yeah. And they just try to get you to go back in that moment so that you can process it. It was so great, I think, about taking steps to do things like see a counselor, which for some reason is so stigmatized. Mm-hmm. It's crazy. Me and, I don't know why I keep mentioning me and Andrea's conversations, but we just, we, we've really been working through this in our marriage and just trying to talk through, um, and you know, in ministry, you you're kind of the the hub of a lot of conversations yeah. like this. It's like a you know, you're, it's like you're a you're a crisis magnet, which is what mm-hmm. we love. This is it's our calling. That's what we want to be a part of. But you end up not just processing your own struggles, but you, as you're doing that, you're thinking of other people who mm-hmm. are maybe don't have the type of support system you do, maybe yeah. who aren't as um, uh, haven't been a, in the following Jesus for a long time and they don't have disciplines that you know would really help them they don't understand a, a lot yet that would be helpful in times of crisis and so you start thinking about other people maybe it's just me I don't know if you guys do the same thing but you start thinking of oh you know I'm going through this I can't imagine what that person's going through because I know yeah. this and and um, so we have a lot of conversations about that and one thing we've just been talking about is I, I can't believe people would avoid seeing a counselor after how much it's helped 
both of us individually yeah. in our marriage. Mm-hmm. Wow. These, and even doctors, like people are afraid to see doctors, people yeah. are afraid to see nutritionists, people are afraid to see these people. Mm-hmm. Um, and we all know people who are like afraid to go to the doctor, you know, mm-hmm. and who are afraid to get help. But um, there's so many implications in your life and the way you're treating the people that love you the most, the way you're treating yourself, the way you're treating your spouse, the way you're treating your kids. And that's one of the reasons I'm, I'm so intense on getting help is because I don't want my dormant unhealth mm-hmm. to pour out sideways in my life to where my kids pick up. You know, I, my kids are going to be screwed up because I'm their dad anyway, but <laughs> I don't want them to be more screwed up than they have to be because I wasn't vulnerable enough and willing mm-hmm. just because I'm a man and I don't need to. And that's just, you know, people who talk about their feelings all the time. People just want to talk about themselves. They don't want to help me. They're just going to ask these questions. You don't know that. That, and every person that I've talked to, you know, you might have to find the right counselor, yeah. but once you do and you find somebody who can really help you go through, they have such great language and tools. Yeah. Like, that's what it is. Maybe it's not yep. anything new, but the language that they can put towards, like, mm-hmm. have you ever been in an environment where somebody says something in, about a topic or about your life or about a hardship? And you're like, yes, that's it. Whatever you just said. That, yeah. Like, when you said that in your sermon about we've been trying to address emotional problems with spiritual practices, that was something I've never had language for, mm-hmm. but I've understood intrinsically about the church, I just never could comprehend why. Mm-hmm. And so, like, if you are avoiding getting help in that way, gosh, don't anymore. Yeah. Uh, most insurances cover it. I mean, man, it is, it is a, it is. Well, it's worth the investment. It is, and it's, it's worth it's, the investment. It's like this. It really is. There's a great example for it. It's like um, you can either go to the dentist or the doctor and get regular checkups. Now, let's not you, talk you, about the dentist. You, I'm bad at that Okay, one. so you go to the dentist and you get regular cleanings, or one day through excruciating pain, you can go get an emergency root canal. Mm. And you're going to get the bill for the emergency root canal. Mm. You know, and I think it's the same way with a medical doctor, right? You can go get checkup, or you can ignore it, and eventually you'll land in the ER, mm-hmm. and you're going to be going in some kind of crisis. The same is just true, I think, with the soul. Mm-hmm. Either you address things and you speak to a counselor if you really need, you might need to, mm-hmm. or you begin to process with somebody that can help you process. You either do it now, or I promise you, mm-hmm. eventually, mm-hmm. you are going to end up in a soul ER, whatever that looks mm-hmm. like. And here's how it's going to spill out. It's going to cost you a lot. It could cost you your marriage. Mm. It could cost you relationship with your kids. It could cost you your career. because All because you have not managed something that has happened to you. Mm-hmm. You have not processed things you've gone through. Uh, and so what it did is spilled out into the way you responded to your boss mm-hmm. and you lost your job, the way you've talked to your spouse, the way you've treated your spouse, the way you shut your spouse out and you didn't talk about anything because just, well, that's what dad did all mm-hmm. the time. And for whatever reason, I've got issues. And so now I don't talk about them. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? There's patterns, genetic patterns and generational patterns and all these things that can play into who you are mm-hmm. and how you respond. So it, it, either you man up and deal with your soul mm-hmm. or you'll eventually deal with it in a really, really painful way. And that's true. So, yeah. yeah, I forget who said it, but emotions are the language of the soul. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I feel like this work is some of us for the first time learning the vowels <laughs> yeah. and, and learning the words and learning mm-hmm. the vocabulary and there's two really dangerous ditches. One is to let your emotions lead you, and the other is to minimize your emotions and mm-hmm. ignore them. Yeah. And when you ignore your emotions, if they're the language of the soul, then the most important, intimate part of who you are, you're neglecting. Yeah. And it could be rotting, and you not even know it. Mm-hmm. And I just think one of the, it, it may be painful, and usually it is pain that makes you slow down. I heard somebody say one time, pain is the main thing that causes us to change. Mm-hmm. The number one thing yeah. in, in human existence that will cause change is pain. Mm-hmm. P- pain is it's also like the carrier oil to get things from our head to our heart. Mm-hmm. There are things that I read about my whole life about Jesus or life or God's love or acceptance that I never knew in my heart until I went through pain. Yeah. And it made me look inside. Yeah. But I think maybe just on a positive note here, I know this is all positive. I mean, it's, it's heavy stuff, but the end result of all this is, is life and freedom. Yeah. Mm-hmm. One of the things that happens when you make yourself vulnerable to look into your soul is there are, you know, Jesus says you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. Well, mm-hmm. You can't be free if you don't know the hooks that are in your soul. One of those hooks that you find is we're going through something called freedom as a staff. And I know as I went through a different version of it a few years ago is there are, 
beliefs that you believe about yourself mostly formed in childhood that will affect how you live your life. Mm -hmm. Uh, In fact, to take it, that whole belief sounds really spiritual, but to take it from spirit to soul, one of the greatest redefinitions of belief I ever heard when I was going through this version of, of freedom curriculum of content from, from Texas is, is the idea that belief is not just something you mentally agree with, Mm -hmm. but to look at belief as a film that, that forms over your heart, usually early in life that may, you may not even have a label for it. You may not even consciously know that it's there, but, and and it could be you're rejected as a child. Mm -hmm. So there's this unspoken belief that forms like a film over your heart Mm -hmm. that I can't trust people and I'll always be rejected. And Mm -hmm. what we don't realize until we go down into our soul Mm -hmm. is that we may have spent five, 10, 15, 20, 40 years perceiving and projecting and experiencing life and giving other people responses through that film. Mm -hmm. And one of the most powerful things that can happen in soul work is to go down to the realm of where those lies are, where the roots are, Mm -hmm. where the unspoken things are, and let those be broken and replaced with truth that will absolutely set you free Mm -hmm. to dimensions that you never thought were possible. Mm -hmm. And then move on to that, to the platform of emotional maturity. I love that. So good. Any last words? No, I just, uh, we're, we're doing this journey as a community, as a church. And um, I just, I think it is probably one of, I've told this to our church, I think this might be one of the most important conversations we have all year. Because mm-hmm. I think we're at a, 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 a mass, a critical mass point in our culture mm-hmm. and in life here in this Western civilization that if we do not make some changes, you know, we're going to, we're going off the rails. And we mm-hmm. see it happening all the time in people's lives. And so uh, it's, it's shifting Things not only in my life, but it's shifting things in how we operate mm-hmm. as a church community. Mm-hmm. We're changing so many things on how we approach people that we can help address people's soul, mm-hmm. not just develop a bunch of spiritual practices and formation, but we can also address and deal with some soul stuff so that we can kind of all of those. And, and I think I would say um, that any area of your life where you're struggling, um, you know, physical, emotional, spiritual, uh, I feel like all of them are interconnected and I feel like you gotta, you have to address these things before mm-hmm. you're going to see growth, mm-hmm. mature, you know, maturity and health in all of those areas. And I, and I, I mean, that's why I, I said this, that's why, um, people will continue to have a battle with losing weight that a lot of times I remember the show biggest loser mm-hmm. and it was never just, Hey, we're going to run you through these workouts and these diets and you do it. They had to address hurts mm-hmm. and they had to address why you allowed yourself to get such bad physical shape that yes. you would get to this point, mm-hmm. like so overweight and you know all that, that there is emotional ties and a soul piece that's the source and the root behind a lot of that. And I think it spills over into the spiritual, it spills over into the physical because mm-hmm. it is who you are and God made us all wrapped up in one. Mm-hmm. And yep. you cannot pick them apart and just go, I'm going to focus on one, ignore the others. That's how you end up in the ER. Yep. So I just, I just I strongly it. just encourage anybody that if there's any way that we can help, uh, I would encourage you, this series soul work, if the, you find this interesting and you're not part of this church community, I would encourage you to lean into all of these mm-hmm. messages or our website um, and talk to a counselor and dive into it. So yeah. thank right. you guys so much. I think, you know, there's the whole reason we dive into the pain is we know that God has purpose in it. Yeah. And I think that's what the difference is when you, when you would follow Jesus. And that's why it fills us with hope yeah. when we have these sorts of trials and and crises and and things that we need to take a deep dive into is because we know there's gold there. And if we can mine for that and we can understand what God's purpose and intent was in these situations in our lives and these relationships and these hurts and these hangups, all these things that we've experienced, that there's a testimony that God wants to build through you. And it's hard to build anything worthwhile uh, in your life if you can't go back to the things that are holding you back and address them. And so that's what we believe God wants for you, is for you to to find wholeness, yeah. to find fullness, experience true joy, to experience true empathy and compassion towards other people, and to have a story that might be able to help somebody who's not you, but is going through the same things you've gone through and the same things that, same things that you've worked through and hopefully will soon uh, hopefully conquer or get to the root of or find the meaning of or learn how to deal with in a healthy way that helps other people. So we hope that for you and we'd love for you to 
Join us on our journey through this series, Soul Work, as we address the things of the soul, what's going to be going on before and after our Easter experience, which is going to be really great. Yep. Sun's coming out, 70 degrees today. Uh, it's really cool uh, to see what uh, is going on through this podcast, through our church, and we are so glad that you are a part of the Global X family. If you have any questions, you want, us, want us to talk about anything on the air, you can send an email to podcast at thex.church. You can subscribe on YouTube. You can like on everywhere you find your podcast, share, review. We love you. Talk to you next week.